so uh, a very good morning everyone and uh, today is monday 21st of june and we are back with the next session of this plant uh, breeding course and uh, i would request uh, dr sujatha to kindly introduce the speaker for today thank you prachi i have great pleasure in welcoming dr sundaram as a speaker for today's uh, talk dr sundaram is currently working as a director of indian institute of rice research at hyderabad since may 2021 so it's a recent uh, appointment he's taken and he leads the uh, coordinated rice uh, research program on rice improvement the aiscrp program Regarding his education, he has done his B.Sc. in Tamil Nadu Agricultural University, M.Sc. in G.G. Pant University, Ph.D. in the University of Hyderabad. So he has visited a number of places, and then he joined uh, the Indian Institute of Rice Research in 1998, where uh, he worked on rice molecular breeding. Um, biotic stress resistance and hybrid rice and transgenics has been his uh, main areas of work he has a very important achievement to his credit that is he is responsible for uh, bringing out the improved samba masuri rice rp bio 226 which is a high yielding blight resistant uh, uh, fine grained rice with a low glycemic index and it is the first uh, marker assisted selection product which is grown over 2 lakh hectares in the country so this is a very major achievement which he did along with his colleagues at uh, center for cellular and molecular biology he uh, is currently working on genetics and uh, breeding of rice for low soil phosphorus phosphorus tolerance he is also working on the functional analysis of rice biotic stress interaction and um, the nitrogen fixation environment of the rice ecosystem uh, and of course yield he has undergone intensive training at the international rice research institute in philippines he has also worked at cornell university and the iowa state university during his career he has to his credit over 120 publications in international journals of high impact factor and around 30 papers in national journals and he has uh, received several awards the latest one being the dbt award for biotech products and process uh, development commercialization which he got in 2015 15 he is a fellow of several academies and societies and he is the editor in chief of the journal of rice research um, he also is an editor of important journals like plos one etc he works on several national committees of um, the government of india uh, he is on the committee of dna fingerprinting of crops he is on the birac technical advisory committee uh, and several other responsibilities besides his responsibility at the iirr i now request dr sundaram to give a talk on development of climate change resilient line of samba masuri through molecular breeding dr sundaram thank you very much thank you everyone um, i take this opportunity to thank uh, dr sujatha uh, dr vidya gupta dr prachi and our uh, Uh, entire uh, team of organizers for organizing this interesting uh, lecture series uh, uh, i'm just uh, starting the opening the presentation uh, just a moment uh, i believe uh, all of you are able to see my presentation am i right yes yes okay, okay. so uh, so uh, the topic of my talk is multi trait improvement of samba masuri variety Through molecular breeding, it's one of the most popular variety here in South India. It's known by various names like uh, Sona Masuri. Uh, probably, when you move uh, towards north, uh, particularly in Maharashtra, in the Vidarbha area, it is known by various names like PKV HMT, HMT Sona, and by other names. So, my journey uh, of rice research started with this variety in the year 1998 when I joined IIRR. So, my journey of uh, what I learned, where I As a team, we faltered, or where I faltered, 
and uh, where uh, we are now in terms of macro-rested breeding or molecular breeding. Uh, I'm going to share my journey with you. Remember, this is not a regular lecture series wherein I uh, talk to you for something and then you listen and then go away. So uh, I'll be moving sections after section. So in case if you're not for able to follow any of the points or anything, feel free to raise up your hand or at the end of the talk also be ready with your questions. So I have a, uh, I'll also share a copy of my presentation as a PDF file. Uh, so no need for you to exactly note down point by point. They, I'll share these uh, slides as a PDF file. And if you have any queries or anything, you're always free, free to interact with me. So I'm just going to share my journey in terms of macro-rested breeding or molecular breeding uh, at IER starting from 1998 with, through this presentation. So the outline of my presentation will be something uh, like this. Initially, I'll just talk about uh, various threats for uh, uh, ensuring or enhancing rice production in the near future. Of course, one important threat is climate change and uh, how uh, application of macro-rested selection uh, was made for developing bacterial blight resistant version of uh, Samba Masuri. Then I'll also talk about uh, development of uh, version two and version three of uh, improved Samba Masuri. That is a variety of versions wherein uh, which are resistant not only to bacterial blight disease, but also to other biotic and abiotic stresses and also with higher yield through macro-rested breeding. And uh, I'll just conclude uh, uh, at the end of my presentation, what are all my own ideas? And I'll also invite feedback from you how this whole process can be improved. Remember, I'm not going to give a gold standard with regard to macro-rested breeding or macro-rested selection. I'm just going to share uh the experiences where what i have gathered in the last 23 24 years of my journey in this particular topic so now let's talk about uh, the threat of climate change in agriculture of course uh, there are many ch challenges for uh, ensuring food and rice security in the 21st century one of the major problem is increasing population wherein we have to feed uh, additional 1.75 billion uh, bellies by 2025 and uh, one of the major challenges in terms of um, feeding uh, the additional uh, members of population is that 85% come from developing nations, while 15% comes from developed nations. So uh, one of the major problems with respect to the diet of uh, developing nations is that they depend mostly on cereals like rice. And another, of course, very looming threat is climate change, which I believe uh, since uh, most of you are in Maharashtra state, you might have already witnessed change in uh, rainfall pattern, change in uh, temperature, change in climate, and this will have a major impact in crop production and more specifically about rice production. Let's quickly see what kind of impact it will have in India particularly. So uh, the average surface temperatures are uh, expected to increase by about 2 to 4 degrees centigrade by 2050. 2 is the absolute lower limit. Four may be the higher limit, which we are all apprehending. So there will be marginal changes in monsoon months, but there will be large changes during non-monsoon months. This is what we are witnessing, like say unseasonal rain, untimely rain, which is affecting various crops like Alfonso mango, and even wheat crop is also affected, particularly due to heavy rains during its maturity. And number of rainy days, it may increase by more, it may decrease by more than 15 days. That's one of the major threat but it will be compensated by increase in the intensity of rain. So it's a sort of a double attack on farmers because the number of rainy days will decrease and the intensity of rains will increase. And this will result in large scale flooding and also large scale drought. And there will also be increasing intensity of cyclonic storms, which uh, one of which we uh, already saw recently hitting the West Coast and causing enormous damage. And uh, I'm sorry, my screen is frozen. I don't know why. Yeah. So as you can see here, uh, this is the kind of uh, temperature changes uh, uh, which are anticipated uh, in near future. Uh, the most vulnerable areas will be the coastal areas, wherein there will be, in addition to increase in uh, uh, the sea level, there will also be increased uh, intensity of rains with lesser number of rainy days. And uh, what, what impact does it have on agriculture? As you can see here, 
there will be decrease in yield of crops as temperature increases in different parts of the country. For every 2 degrees centigrade increase in mean temperature yield, rice yields could decrease by about 0.75 tons per hectare in high yielding areas. This damage will be even more severe in rain-fed rice ecosystem, which depends solely on rain for uh, sustenance. And uh, this is practiced by some of the poorest farmers for subsistence. So it will hit uh, the poor farmers or marginal farmers very, very hard, particularly the rice farmers. And uh, the loss in farm level net revenue will range between anywhere between 9 to 25% for a minimum temperature rise of 2 to 3.5 degrees centigrade. We are anticipating by 2050, it will be somewhere in between 3 to 4 degrees centigrade. In whatever may be, it will be a great uh, threat which we all need to face together. And uh, other important aspect uh, which is relevant to my talk is climate change has already shown that it can increase the incidence of pests and diseases and also abiotic stresses in rice crop. Many of the minor or um, minor pests or diseases, they have uh, been uh, uh, converted to major pests and we are seeing increased incidence of pests and diseases in the last say three or four years in rice. So what could be the solution in order to overcome or mitigate the damages induced by climate change and to increase production and productivity to feed the global population or Indian population. One solution through biotechnology is marker assisted breeding, wherein molecular markers which are linked to the genes or uh, QTLs of interest, they are being used to track the presence of genes in particular uh, uh, breeding populations so that uh, the breeding process not only can become more precise, but also more faster. And of course, another important tool is genetic engineering, which has got much more potential than marker-assisted breeding in the sense that uh, genetic engineering can be helpful to bring in the variability across the gene pool. From any organism, you can bring in the variability, while the gains or developments with regard to marker-assisted breeding or marker-assisted selection, which is also called as molecular breeding, it is only limited to uh, variation available in the primary and secondary gene pool of rice. Even though macrostrid breeding has certain limitations, as I told you, but it is it has been the method of choice for most of the rice breeders because there are con some concerns related to genetic engineering, considering the fact that rice is a food crop. There are a lot of regulatory and then social issues which need to be overcome. So in my talk today, I'll be restricting my presentation with regard to macrostrid breeding. We'll also be seeing, like, say, how uh, what exactly are the basics of macrostrid breeding how it has been applied to develop a bacterial blight resistant version of the variety Samba Masuri, and how we have also applied to develop uh, further improved versions of Samba Masuri, which not only have more durable resistance against other diseases and pests, but also resistance or tolerance against uh, abiotic stresses, and also which have higher yield. And then finally, I'll also touch up upon uh, the topic of genomics, which is the in thing for the last about a decade or so. This has become uh, an important topic or important component of biotechnology research, particularly after uh, completion of genome sequence of rice. Uh, since uh, 2002, we have been having various draft genome and then final say, genome sequence of rice. As on date, more than 5,000 uh, uh, varieties or uh, cultures of rice have been sequenced. So this has resulted in identification of precise location of uh, various agronomically important genes like resistant genes, genes for higher yield, et cetera. So the, the process of discoveries in genomics has accelerated by the progress related to marker-assisted breeding and also in terms of genetic engineering. So what exactly is a molecular marker? So if you all are uh, just, you can go back to your uh, high school, high, higher secondary school uh, uh, biology classes. As you all know, like say the DNA is present uh, wrapped up in the form of chromosomes inside the nucleus. DNA is also present in the cytoplasm also. In uh, animal cells, it's present only in the form of uh, mitochondrial DNA, while in the case of plants, it is present as both mitochondrial and also chloroplast DNA. So a marker is nothing but a stretch of small stretch of DNA, which is present closely located near a gene. Such markers are called as link markers or gene link markers. There is also another case, particularly in crops like rice, wherein there's a lot of development related to genomics. For most of the uh, agronomically important genes in rice, we have markers which, are, which belong to class two markers called as genes uh, specific markers or functional markers. So uh, I'm not going to deal with uh, uh, what exactly are these two kinds of markers, 
but you need to take home that marker two or functioning markers are always better than gene linked markers wherein there is always a case of losing the presence of gene due to linkage but in uh, functional markers they are part of the gene so there is no way wherein we will be losing the gene or the favorable allele of the gene in the process of breeding so um, uh, as i have uh, mentioned to you uh, how biotechnology can play a role in terms of uh, so uh, in terms of uh, making crops adaptive to climate change Venus frozen just a moment um if you can see uh, the process of marker stud breeding is nothing but using molecular markers to track the presence of gene rather than exposing the population to a particular stress or for identification of a particular uh, important trait so as you can see here consider that these are two parents parent one is susceptible to a major disease say bacterial blight and parent two is resistant to the disease parent one and parent two may have some advantageous features some disadvantages features for example the disadvantages feature of parent two here is is its uh, uh, high yield uh, sorry its low yield uh, with respect to parent one its susceptibility to that particular disease so if you had to combine the advantages traits of both parent one and parent two what we had to do is we have to uh, make a cross develop f1 or so the first filial generation self it to develop f2s so in the f2s what kind of plants you had to select for example for this particular resistance gene the susceptible allele when you isolate dna amplify it in a thermal cycler and then load it in agarose gel you'll see its presence as a higher molecular weight bag fragment while in the case of p2 or resistant variety we'll see that uh, it is displayed in terms of a lower molecular weight fragment so if you can see here we'll be selecting plants which are homozygous for the resistant allele which is present in p2 and then advancing them and then making further selection in f3 f4 and all but what we are ensuring at f2 generation with the help of marker stud breeding is that all the plants have the resistant gene in a homozygous condition so uh, this this particular process that is improvement of economically important traits through indirect selection based on dna markers which are uh, generally pcr based of late we are seeing lot of snp based markers or single nucleotide polymorphism markers also which are linked or which are part of the gene or specific for the genes or qtls is called as marker stud breeding which are also called as molecular breeding so let's see how it can be helpful to develop a single cultivar or a sub, um, how to make a major variety tolerant or resistant to multiple diseases for example consider that this is one of the most popular variety of maharashtra so this is uh, india of course as uh, it's known with many popular varieties most of them are susceptible to the major pests and diseases for example in rice we have major diseases like bacterial blight blast we have major insect pests like galmich and then brown plant hopper there are various donors are there for these particular genes and these genes can be transferred through cross breeding or hybridization but this particular transfer if done through conventional breeding wherein there are no markers linked to these genes it takes years and years even within 15 years or 20 years we cannot transfer these gene and then make this elite variety tolerant or resistant against these two major diseases and pests but if we have a marker linked to each one of these resistant genes first you can transfer these resistant genes through back cross breeding a process i'll explain to you later individually then combine two back cross plants with each other and then finally combine all the four important genes or four important traits in the background of elite cultivar potentially within a period of 6 uh, to 8 years through back marker stud back cross breeding the only requirement is that we need to have uh, identify a molecular marker which is linked to the favorable allele or gene favorable allele of the gene of interest so uh, this is how molecular markers can make life of breeders very easy and as you can see here in conventional breeding even though we start both uh, in conventional breeding and marker stud breeding or molecular breeding we start with the same set of breeding lines at f2 f3 generation by the time we uh, go for commercial launch of varieties in conventional breeding it takes about 8 to 10 years while in case of marker stud breeding it takes just about 4 to 6 years you'll see with a live or real example also uh, when i'll be talking later how molecular breeding or marker stud breeding 
can decrease the time taken for breathing. So now let's uh, travel or uh, climb upon the uh, uh, ladder of DNA and then see where life has taken me forward. So now let's go to uh, how uh, my team or our team has uh, developed an improved version of a very popular variety called Samba Masuri and made it bacterial blight resistant and then made it as improved Samba Masuri. So as you all are aware, there are many major biotic stresses which can limit rice seeds minimum up to 25 to 30 percent. And these include insect tests like stem borer, leaf folder, brown plant hopper, garbage, and also insect diseases like blast, bacterial blight, sheet blight, rice to grow virus. So I specifically put certain diseases as green color and certain other diseases as uh, red color. This is principally because for pests like brown plant hopper or galmich or diseases like blast and bacterial blight, we have got very good variability existing in the primary gene pool of rice. And we also have identified the location of these resistant genes conferring either bacterial blight resistance or blast resistance. However, in the case of stem borer, leaf folder, or sheet blight or rice tungro virus, so far resistance breeding has not been very successful because the variability in the primary gene pool of rice is very limited. We don't have strong stem borer resistant donor lines. That's one of the major problems why macrostate selection has succeeded in brown plant hopper, galmich, blast and bacterial leaf blight, while it has failed in terms of stem borer resistance or leaf holder resistance or sheet blight resistance. Now, in terms of resistance breeding, when uh, India started breeding its own rice variety, starting with the establishment of my institute, that is uh, uh, Indian Institute of Rice Research. It was started as All India Coordinated Rice Improvement Project in the year 1965. And uh, through the establishment of this institute, breeding process started. Initially, our focus was on developing very high yielding varieties. Slowly, we started move, moving towards developing resistant varieties. In those days, we didn't know where these genes are located and what exactly are uh, the function or role of these genes. But still, we did breeding. Because of this uh, conventional breeding, uh, limitations imposed by conventional breeding, we were able to transfer just one or two genes into the background of major varieties. So even though these varieties showed resistance for a period of five to 10 years, beyond 10 years, all these varieties were, became susceptible to some of the major uh, emerging virulent strains of pests and pathogen. So in order to overcome that, uh, and also in, the, in view of the looming threat of climate change, uh, we need to deploy multiple genes, at least two or more genes or their combinations through gene pyramiding or through, through gene stacking. How gene pyramiding we can do it, I'll show you the example how we did it in the background of Sambha Masuri. So um, as I told you, bacterial blight is the second major production constraint with regard to diseases. It is prevalent in most of the rice growing areas in the country. As you all will see this map, in almost all uh, regions of India, rice is grown. As you can see here, except for some parts of Rajasthan, major parts of Jammu Kashmir and major parts of Gujarat, uh, rice is being grown. It's also important that Bacterial blight is also very much prevalent in these regions. These regions are called as hotspot locations, wherein bacterial blight will always be there in the soil or in the air. And then every time you grow rice, the disease will come. So uh, what exactly causes bacterial blight disease? It's a bacterium called as Xanthomonas oryzae, PV oryzae. We call it in short form as zoo or exoho. So when it infects the rice field, the leaf, when not infected, it will be just green in color. When it is infected by the bacteria, it will turn brown and the whole field blights. It gives a burnt up appearance and the minimum damage will be about 10% every year in the country and maximum damage can go up to 30 or even 50%. One of the major problems of bacterial blight is that it occurs in the irrigated ecosystem wherein rice is grown in a very intensive way. So the only way of managing the disease is even though some chemicals like uh, antibiotics are available for spraying, they are not very effective because once this disease occurs in one plant, it will within say about half a day or one day, it will spread across the entire field and then uh, it will be devastating. The only way of managing the disease is through resistance breeding. And there are more than 45 resistant genes available for bacterial blight. They are called as exe genes, exe1, exe2, exe21, like that. And uh, as we have all seen, or uh, the last uh, four or five decades, we are clearly seeing that varieties with single resistant gene containing varieties are uh, highly susceptible to the disease. So what we had to do is, this is principally because there are more than 22 pathotypes of the pathogen existing across the country. 
So what we had to do is we had to combine multiple genes, at least two or more genes in the genetic background of a single variety so that resistance breeding is very durable or it lasts longer. So as you can see here, all the major rice growing areas of the country like Punjab, Uttar Pradesh, Chhattisgarh, Tamil Nadu, Karnataka, Telangana, all are affected by bacterial blight disease. So coming to the variety Samba Masuri, uh, when I joined uh, IARR, or the, it was earlier known as Directorate of Rice Research or DRR. So uh, Samba Masuri was and is one of the major popular varieties grown in both Telangana and Andhra Pradesh. At that point of time, a few farmers from coastal area of Andhra Pradesh, like uh, uh, East Godari and West Godari, and also from Karnul area of uh, Tungabhadra command area, came forward to us with a plea that uh, they grow a very popular variety called Samba Masuri. They, it is, uh, its yield is affected year after year because of bacterial blight, because it's highly susceptible to bacterial blight. But one of the advantages of Samba Masuri is that it has got excellent drain and cooking quality, and uh, it fetches at least a minimum of 250 to 400 rupees per quintal or 100 kgs as compared to ordinary varieties. So they cannot grow any other variety uh, which has resistance. So they wanted a resistant version of Samba Masuri, which not only cooks and looks like Samba Masuri and also shows high yield, but also shows very good level of bacterial blight resistance. As you can see here, uh, the present area under Samba Masuri is more than 3 million hectare under cultivation. It is known by various names like Sona Masuri, Karnul Masuri, Varangal Masuri, PKV HMT, HMT Sona. There are various trade names to it. It's even now grown in uh, areas of North India like Eastern UP, Bihar and Jharkhand. And uh, as I told you, it has got very high yield, exceptional grain quality, but susceptible to bacterial blight. So the need when I started my career at that point of time was, uh, based on the request from farmers, we conceptualized a project proposal in collaboration with uh, Dr. Ramesh Sonti's group at CCMB. So we had a target to transfer effective bacterial blight resistant genes into Samba Masuri background without loss of its unique quality and yield characteristics. So that was the barest minimum, uh, which we decided that we should go ahead. So this is a clear field of Samba Masuri. As you can see here, the grains are far and few, and the disease has totally devastated the entire field. So before we started the work, as in case of any scientific investigation, we need to ask a few questions ourselves, and then try to answer these questions to, through this particular study, and uh, proceed ahead so that durable solution can be obtained. So what are the questions we asked ourselves? First, we asked, what is the genetic diversity within the population of the pathogen? That is Xanthomonas varese, PV varese, or exo strains in the country. Then the second question is, what are all the rice resistant genes that are effective against Indian strains of exo that can be deployed in Samba Masuri? And then of course, the third question is, what could be the donor genotype, which should be in a, possibly in an allied background, possessing all the suitable R genes? So the first question was answered by a study which was carried out even before I joined way back in 1997 itself, wherein multiple uh, pathogen strains were collected from rice plants growing in many different locations in the country. And these were subjected to DNA fingerprinting and then pathotype analysis. So based on the analysis, two main pathotypes were identified in the country through a publication uh, done by CCMB and IRR in the year 1997. So those two uh, pathotypes or groups were called as group one and group two. Group two was very predominant. So at that point of time, they had some uh, neoestrogenic lines or uh, varieties under a single genetic background of IR24 having these single resistant genes. For example, IRB, uh, IR24 variety with XA3 is called as IRBB3. With XA4, it's called as XA4, XA5, like that. So about uh, uh, six different single gene combinations we tested against uh, uh, the, uh, the bacterium belonged to group 1 and group 2, while XA13 and XA21 showed more or less resistance against all the groups. We were concerned about group 1, which was uh, very much predominant or which was very much virulent. So we decided that even though XA13 and XA21 are expected to give durable resistance, we thought of adding XA5 gene, which gave moderate resistance against group 1. So we thought that a combination of XA21, XA13, and XA5 is a good combination. As you can see here, I have written XA21 in capitals because this is a dominant gene. 
while XA13 and XA5 are recessive genes. What it means is that while XA21 will express in both heterozygous and homozygous condition, XA13 and XA5 will express only in a homozygous condition. So uh, now this, uh, we have answered what are all the what is the level of variability in the pathogen and what are all the effective resistant gene combination uh, which can work against uh, this particular disease in the background of Samba Masuri. Now we try to answer the third question. That is what could be the donor which could have uh, uh, very good resistance uh, against this particular disease in terms of all these presence of all these three genes and it should also be there in an elite genetic background. Those who are good old days, Dr. Uh, Vidya Gupta may recall, wherein exchange of material happened very freely. So at that point of time, PAU had developed an improved version of that popular variety called PR106 with XA21, XA13 and XA5. So the person who developed this particular uh, version of PR106 with XA21, 13 and 5 is called as Dr. Supinder Singh. So he named that line as SS111313, 113, which had these three genes in the background of PR106. So as soon as we requested him to hand over this particular line, he readily shared with us. So we used this particular line as a donor because SS 3113, even though it is a long bold variety, unlike Samba Masuri, which is a medium slender or short slender variety, but still it was high yielding and it had shorter duration. So we wanted that uh, it, uh, whatever donor will be using, it should also be there in an allied genetic background. Now coming to how we actually transferred uh, this particular gene into the background of Samba Masuri using SS 3113 as the donor for XA5, XA13 and XA21. So since we wanted a version of Samba Masuri at the end of four or five or six years, which looks exactly like Samba Masuri and looks, cooks exactly like Samba Masuri, we went for a backcross breeding program. In backcross breeding program, what do we do? We cross the donor parent with the recipient parent. Here, the donor is SS1313, the recipient is Samba Masuri. Just imagine that this has got a green genome and Samba Masuri has got a yellow color genome. So in F1, both the genomes will be equal, 50-50. When you backcross the F1 with Samba Masuri, uh, the proportion of SS1313 genome, that's the green genome, will reduce. So this particular process of backcross breeding, we continue till BC4F1 generation. And by BC4F1 generation, what remained from SS1313 were only the favorable alleles of XA5, XA13, and XA21. And most of the other genetic background, more than 95% of the background, looked like Samba Masuri. So that's, that, that is the reason why we went for a backcross breeding or marker-rested backcross breeding. How did we use in terms of molecular markers? At that point of time, we had a very closely linked PCR-based marker or amplicon-linked polymorphism marker, which is also called as ALP marker, called PTA248, which was indeed, now we know that it's indeed part of the gene, and it was very close to the gene on, and located on chromosome 11. For XA13, we had a marker called RG136, which is a CAPS marker, or a PCR based RFLP marker. So one major problem in using this CAPS marker is that after isolation of DNA, setting up PCR, after amplification of the fragment, you have to uh, do a restriction digestion with a particular restriction enzyme. So it's a two-step process, while amplicon linked polymorphism markers are one-step process. Still, this was the only marker available with us for XA30. Similarly, for XA5, the marker's name is RG556. As you can see here, while the markers for XA21, that is PTA248, and the marker for XA5, that is RG556, these are all uh, very closely linked markers. So linkage is indicated by centimorgan. So uh, one centimorgan is one percent recombination, while 0.1 centimorgan is one recombination every thousand plants or uh, more than that. So the marker for XA21 is very closely linked, and XA5 is also closely linked, while XA13 was not closely linked. But since we didn't have any other uh, way to select for XA13, we opted for this CAPS marker. And then how did we rapidly identify a backcross plant either at BC1 F1 or BC2 F1 or BC3 F1? We deployed a set of microsatellite markers, about uh, 400 or 440 were available in those days, around 90, uh, 2000, 1999 uh, uh, around. So out of that, we identified that 90 markers are polymorphic between SS1313 and Samba Masuri. And this particular backcrossing was carried out till BC4F1. And as I mentioned earlier, this was uh, this particular development was carried out with myself as a principal investigator here in IRR. 
and Dr. Ramesh Sonti, who is also my mentor, he served as a, 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 a wholesome mentor for this particular program and led the team at CCMB. And Dr. Vishnu Priya was also closely associated with this development. So as you can see here, these are the 12 maps of uh, rice chromosomes. So exe 5 gene is located in the telosinomeric region of chromosome 5. And the closely linked markers are G556. exe 30 is located on uh, near the central near of the chromosome 8. The closely linked marker is RG136. And exe 21 is located uh, very close to uh, the marker PTA248 on chromosome 11. All these markers, the markers given in uh, uh, light green color are those markers which you use for background selection. Even though we couldn't cover the entire genome of rice, there are a lot of gaps here, but that was the thing which was available with us. And then we proceeded ahead with these markers. You'll understand why we went for marker-stead backdrops breeding or why we deployed uh, markers for background selection. I'll just explain it to you. So as I mentioned to you, uh, we went in a stepwise process wherein we developed the F1. The F1 were backcrossed with Samba Masuri. And then later, the F1s were, uh, after backcrossing, BC1 F1 plants we got. As I mentioned earlier, we had about uh, 145 BC1 F1 plants in the background of uh, Samba Masuri. Uh, as you can uh, see here, uh, about uh, out of when these plants were amplified with the P PCR based marker or amplicon linked polymorphism marker, PTA248, SS1013 shows a 900 base pair fragment, while BPT5204, which is the other name for Samba Masuri, shows a uh, 700 base pair fragment. And all plants which have the favorable allele from SS1013 will show a 900 base pair fragment and then a 700 base pair fragment. Those plants which are star marked are the ones which you carried forward. So about 44 plants had exa 21 among 145. Then the same day afternoon, in uh, uh, using the DNA from these 44 plants, we selected for exa 13 after PCR and restriction digestion with restriction enzyme called uh, HINF1. We identified about uh, three, uh, 23 plants which had exa 13. Then these 23 plants were subjected for selection for exa 5. As you can see here, about 11 plants were positive for exa 5. These 11 plants are not only positive for exa 5 because they are emerged from these 44 plants which are positive for exa 21 and 23 plants which are positive for exa 13. So these 11 plants are positive for all the three genes starting at BC1 F1 generation. So now we had a dilemma. We made all these 11 plants to grow till maturity. We couldn't find any major difference among them. So we were sort of confused. So what we did is we isolated DNA from these 11 plants and then using the background selection markers, those 90 markers which I explained to you in the figure, we, uh, we did a, something called as background selection. As you can see here, uh, I showed you here that 11 plants have all the three genes. As you, uh, as you can see here, uh, this is a, a picture uh, about how we do background selection. So using CCMB's uh, uh, capillary sequencer system, we were able to resolve at least seven to 10 uh, microsatellite markers, which are differing in size or amplicon sizes in the same gel. So this gel represents amplification pattern with two markers, it is RM19 and RM201. As you can see here, uh, the donor parent with respect to RM19 shows a higher molecular weight fragment, while Sambama Suri or BPT5204 shows a lower molecular weight fragment. Same is the case with RM201, which is uh, tagged with another uh, fluorescent color dye. So uh, will I select plant number one, two, five, six, nine, and 10? Definitely not, because they are still heterozygous for Sambama Suri allele, either for one marker or for more markers. So what exactly I'll select? I'll select either plant number three or plant number four or plant number seven or plant number eight, which have become homozygous for Sambama Masuri allele. Uh, with respect to both these markers, but this is only a representation. And uh, we did background selection for all the 90 markers. Based on whatever uh, results we got, we identified that at BC1F1, plant number 273 had 20, 65 markers out of 90 were homozygous for Samba Masuri allele. What is the expected number? Ideally, it should be 75 or near somewhere around 75. We got lesser number, but we we didn't bother at that point of time. We just went ahead and then selected that plant number 273, as you can see here. So this is the plant we carried forward for further backcrossing with 
Samba Masuri. So how many plants we got uh, three gene positive at each generation? In BC1 F1, we screened about 145 plants, 11 were three gene positive. In BC2 generation, out of 156, nine plants were positive. By the time we were at BC4 F1, we had about 10 plants which are uh, three gene positive. So what we did is, we did a background selection with all these 10 BC4 F1 plants, and we identify a single plant wherein 87 out of 90 markers were homozygous for Samba Masuri allele or BPT5204 allele. So this plant was further selled and uh, continued to, uh, up to BC4 F2 generation. At BC4 F2 generation, we identified at least five plants which had all the three genes in a homozygous condition. And all these five plants were advanced as five lines starting from BC4 F2 generation up to BC4 F6 generation. And by the time we were at uh, in the year uh, 2004, we already had uh, about uh, four homozygous lines out of these five BC4 F2 plants. And these were named with the following names like IT190260454659 like that. And all these were nominated for All India Coordinated Trials, wherein these uh, lines were nominated for uh, multi-location trials across the country. So for yield, it was, they were evaluated at more than 24 centers. And for bacterial blight, they were evaluated in more than 15 centers. In these trials, one line, IET19046, was found to be highly resistant to bacterial blight in hotspot locations like Punjab, Haryana, uh, coastal Andhra Pradesh, etc. And also, they, they had the grain and cooking quality very similar to Samba Masuri, along with yield levels similar or slightly higher than Samba Masuri. So based on this criteria, the entry 19046 was released as a new variety under the name Improved Samba Masuri. One important point which I would like you to focus here is, how long did this program take? We started somewhere in the year 2000. And by the year 2003-2004, we already were at BC4, F3, F4 generation. And by 2005, we were able to nominate plants at BC4, F5, F6 generation, which are homozygous and were also uniform. So the total time taken for this entire program is 1999 to 2004. Just within five years, we were able to convert or transform a popular variety into a bacterial blight resistant variety. So this is the power of marker rested breeding or marker rested selection, an important facet of uh, crop biotechnology. So how does this look like? This looks exactly like Samba Masuri in terms of having very fine grain type, very individually separated the cooked grains which will not stick with each other even if you add excess water or cook it excessively. And the plants also show very high yield and a bacterial blight incidence, uh, some bum, improved some bum, this uh, entry called uh, IT 19046 was later released by central government as improved Samba Masuri. This is totally bacterial blight resistance and it yields like Samba Masuri more than five tons per hectare. And it also had low glycemic index. I'll come to that later. So because of all these property, we have already licensed it to three companies for a total cost of about 24 lakhs. And uh, we also, through the support from Government of India, we distributed seeds and other support to more than uh, 10,000 10, Samba Masuri farmers in the states of Andhra Pradesh, Tamil Nadu, Karnataka, etc. And because of these particular efforts, this variety is being grown in more than 3 million hectares. That's about uh, approximately about 10% of Samba Masuri area. We hope that in other, say, five to six years, this variety will be grown in more than 1 million hectares or improved versions of this variety will be grown in more than 5 million hectares. As you can see here in farmer's field, it gives a very good lush crop and it matures about 7 to 10 days earlier than Samba Masuri. So farmers find it very amenable for a special process which is coming up uh, uh, in the recent past called as bed direct seeding, wherein farmers will not grow a nursery, transplant the seedlings, they'll directly sow the seed and then uh, save uh, sufficient uh, quantity of water and also time. And uh, further details about this development, if anybody is interested, this paper is freely downloadable from my ResearchGate uh, uh, library or from Ufitika. Uh, the nitty gritty of marker-rested breeding has been very clearly explained in that publication. And uh, when you say variety is really showing its worth, this is a field in East Godavari. You might have uh, known that in 2015-16, a major cyclone called Hudud uh, appeared in coastal Andhra Pradesh and then it devastated rice crop. So around that time, some improved Samba Masuri was the only variety of rice which could survive from bacterial blight. 
because in cyclonic weather, bacterial blight spreads very fast. You can see here on the right side, you have Samba Masuri, which is severely affected by bacterial blight disease, while improved Samba Masuri, which is on the left side, is totally free from bacterial blight disease. So in that year alone, farmers saved at least 25 to 40% more yield than Samba Masuri in bacterial blight infected areas. And a survey done by uh, Manage, uh, National Academy of Agricultural Extension Management, they have evaluated just in a five year period, just with an investment of say about 50 lakhs for this project, this has given a net returns for about two for rupees 240 crores or about 2,400 uh, million rupees to the farmers. And uh, how does it uh, improve Samba Masuri look? It looks exactly similar to Samba Masuri, both in terms of cooked rice, sorry, milled rice and also cooked rice. And of course, uh, uh, when we carried out a general survey for uh, glycemic index of all the rice varieties released by IARR, Surprisingly, um, uh, this variety improved Samba Masuri. It had a low glycemic index. As we all know, rice is considered as a high glycemic index food. That's why it is not suitable for uh, diabetic patients. But this particular variety, I didn't do any breeding process for it. This variety along with Samba Masuri, uh, this has been validated through clinical trials to have a very low glycemic index of 50.99 or 51. So because of this particular uh, property, at least three companies are uh, come forward to license this variety. Probably by August or September, you may see improved Samba Masuri in the shelves of uh, supermarkets, wherein uh, the company Fortune, Adani Wilmer, has come forward to market it under the brand name Fortune as a low glycemic index rice variety. Remember, this was a serendipitous discovery. And then my team or Dr. Amesh team did not breed for low glycemic index. It just happened by chance. And uh, one of the major concerns uh, uh, in recent years is uh, a study done by one, my first PhD student, Yugendar, what he did is he uh, deployed various uh, single gene, two gene, three gene, four gene, five gene combinations against multiple uh, strains of bacterium belonging to different pathotypes. As you can see here, pathotypes are organized from less virulent in pathotype one and more virulent will be in pathotype 22. So one thing that is of concern is improved Samba Masuri which has got XA5, XA13, and XA21, is almost resistant or moderately resistant to all the pathotypes. But still, we have a pathotype which appears to be compromising the resistance present in improved Samba Masuri. So there is a need to fortify additional resistant genes in the background of Samba Masuri. So where did we go? We went for wild rices. As you all may know, wild rices are excellent reservoir of ag agronomically important genes and also yield enhancing genes. So we identified a wild rice species called as Oreza nivara, an accession of Oreza nivara called IRGC105710. So from that, we fine mapped. We also did a basic genetic study and also uh, cloning work. We identified a gene called as XA33, which uh, is present on uh, chromosome 7 short arm. And this particular gene was transferred into the background of Samba Masuri and also improved Samba Masuri. And similarly, my colleague, uh, Dr. Laha, along with uh, my student, Yugendar, they have transferred another major gene identified by Punjab Agriculture University from Oreza Nivara called XA33, which is present on chromosome 4. And a, a product containing XA33 in the genetic background of uh, uh, improved Samba Masuri, which means improved Samba Masuri already has XA5, 13, and 21. Plus, uh, my team has added another resistant gene called XA38. Along with that, we also selected for higher yielding versions and we limited our back crossing only to three. So a new variety called DRR than 53 has been recently released. And uh, this particular version is doing uh, very well in most of the Samba Masuri or improved Samba Masuri cultivation areas. But of course, we are not estimated its low glycemic index. And another major point which we need to understand is Samba Masuri or improved Samba Masuri, we are fortified with additional uh, bacterial blight resistant genes. We are sure about its bacterial blight resistance, but it doesn't have tolerance or resistance against any other disease or any other pest. As you all know, farmers, when they came back to us in 1998, they indeed mentioned that bacterial blight is a major problem, but they also mentioned that diseases like blast, brown plant hopper, galmish, they are also indeed very serious problems in Samba Masuri cultivation. And it's also highly susceptible to flooding and also to drought and salinity. So what we did is we initiated a program way back in 2012-13 to 
add or uh, fortify or add value to Samba Masuri in terms of transferring additional genes. So how did we do it? I'll be explaining it in the third part of my presentation. So uh, shall we stop here for a few, taking a few questions or shall we go ahead forward? Uh, we should go ahead with the okay. go ahead with the presentation. Okay. I think so. that's fine. So you can take the questions in the last. So uh, what we have done is over the last about uh, uh, nine or ten years, we have added additional bacterial blight resistant genes, and we have also added two blast resistant genes, uh, at least a major BPH resistance gene, garbage rest two garbage resistant genes, uh, low soil P tolerant version of Samba Masuri, saline T tolerant, drought tolerant, submergent tolerant and also a higher yielding version of Samba Masuri or improved Samba Masuri. So in all these, how many are already reached varietal release stage or on the verge of release? We have versions with yield or final year of testing. Uh, Samba Masuri with XA38 has already been released as a new variety. Uh, I'm happy to say that this year in the uh, varietal identification committee, an entry containing, uh, in addition to XA21, 13 and 5, two major blast resistant genes which work against both leaf blast and neck blast. This has been identified as a new variety called dearer than 51, sorry, 61. And uh, versions with uh, low soil P tolerance and saline T tolerance, they have also been identified for varietal release. Products with drought tolerance and submergence tolerance, they are under development just like garbage and BPS resistance. As you can see here, uh, this is an entry having not only bacterial blight resistance, but also high yield and also blast resistance. So this entry has been identified for varietal release as dearer than 62. And uh, we also have versions of Samba Masuri having brown plant hopper resistance. So this is after sowing. When you release the brown plant hopper insects or uh, their nymphs, only those which have BPS 30, they will survive. As you can see here, this is a multi-location trial evaluation data, wherein across all the locations, this particular entry is showing very good level of tolerance. And this also, these are also entries with garbage resistance, wherein by chance we have identified a few plants having more grain number per panicle. And uh, as I mentioned to you, uh, low for, uh, soil phosphorus is an important uh, issue in rice farming, particularly in upland areas. It's now becoming a major problem even in irrigated or semi-irrigated areas also. So for this, in many Indian land races like Kasalat, uh, Nagina 22, we have a major uh, QTL or a major gene called as PS tall kinase. The gene has been identified and cloned on chromosome 12 and very good markers are available. So when uh, this particular gene is there, PS tall kinase, in the absence of P, normal variety cannot grow well, but a variety or its near isogenic line with POP1 can grow well with deeper root system. So we can get higher yield under moderate or low application of soil phosphorus. As we all may know, DAP, one of the major phosphatic fertilizers or superphosphate, these are one of the costliest fertilizers in the country. So for this particular transfer, we went for a backcross breeding program wherein the backcrossing was just restricted to two. And we deployed markers not only for foreground selection and recombinant selection, but also for background selection. And uh, as you can see here, we have a low soil phosphorus plot wherein the soil available soil phosphorus is only to the tune of less than 5 ppm. Improved Samba Masuri, as you can see here, or Samba Masuri, it cannot grow at all. It just puts in two or three leaves and then dies. While the donor parent, Swarna, which has POP1, and then also uh, improved Samba Masuri lines with POP1, they can grow very luxuriously in these uh, low P soils by producing a more robust root system. And this entry is also resistant to bacterial blight. So this has been identified for varietal release as an entry called as, or as a variety called as DRR than 59. And uh, another development with regard to this thing is we have a major QTL or a gene called as Salton, which has been identified from a Kerala land race called as Pokali. This confers excellent tolerance at seedling stage to salinity. As you can see here, without uh, Saltol, improved Samba Masuri, it hardly puts in few roots, while the donor parent puts in very good number of roots. Uh, and uh, under uh, prolonged exposure to salinity, as you can see here, uh, improved Samba Masuri hardly grows, while versions with uh, salt on can grow really well under uh, uh, salinity, even up to the level of 120 millimolar. So this particular entry having a salinity tolerance has been released as or identified for release as dearer than 57. And these are all the, those entries uh, uh, shown in normal soil condition. 
uh, they grow as uh, good or as bad as uh, improved samba masuri in terms of plant type, grain type, and all. And uh, this is a typical field wherein both salinity and sodicity is there in the Tamil Nadu Agriculture University. So through our coordinated trials, we tested both improved samba masuri with salt oil, that is DRR than 59, sorry, 57, and then improved samba masuri. As you can see here, improved samba masuri is almost gone. While with salt oil, the plant is able to tolerate salinity and sodicity to a significant extent and then survive. So the last effort regarding adding value to improved samba masuri is that we are uh, added two additional traits, one is submergence tolerance and then drought tolerance through transfer of major genes or QTLs. And then we are trying to develop improved samba masuri double plus. And these plants are at BC2, F2 and then F6 generation. And this is so submergence occurs in many parts of India wherein samba masuri or varieties like Swarna are cultivated. This is not pertaining to samba masuri. As you can see here, after floods, Swarna is totally devastated. But sub one Swarna with uh, the submergence tolerance genes, it grows very luxuriously even after prolonged submergence. And then it can tolerate submergence. And similarly, this is our entry which is having the drought tolerant QTL 3.1. This is improved samba masuri without that uh, particular QTL. So as you can see here in the severe drought, the plants can still survive and then low leaf rolling or low leaf rolling is seen. While in the case of improved samba masuri, very severe retardation of plant growth is seen. And uh, coming to the last part of my presentation, uh, I'm just going to explain that we have also transferred some of the yield enhancing genes. For example, GN1A is a major yield enhancing gene identified by uh, Dr. Ashikari's group in Japan. So this gene was identified to increase the uh, number of grains per panicle. And another gene called as wealthy farmers panicle or OSSPL14, it increases panicle branching and also the grain number. And then we also transferred a third gene called as strong calm gene or SCM2. So all these genes have been transferred and we can clearly see the effects. This is improved Samba Masuri, giving a moderate yield of five to six tons. This is improved Samba Masuri, with GN1A, OSSPL14, and also the strong cull. What is interesting is that even though more number of grains are there, the, uh, the, uh, the plant is able to bear the heavy weight of these panicles because it has got a strong stem or strong cull. And uh, as you can see here, because of uh, these two yield enhancing genes, GN1A and OSSPL14, as compared to improved Sambamasuri or Sambamasuri, there is pronounced branching and uh, one such entry is already there in the final year of ECRIP testing. Probably next year it will be identified and released as a new variety. As you can see here, a single plant produces more than 25 30 tillers. Most of them are productive with long branches and also very, very sturdy panicle axis and also stem. So, uh, through this, I just like to tell that even complex traits like yield can be improved if you identify the right set of genes. So, in parallel, my colleagues. Uh, Dr. Sarla, Dr. Siddiq's group, they had identified some of the yield enhancing genes from wild rices, and they are transferred into the background of hybrid rice parental lines. And they have also developed versions of Swarna with higher grain number. One such version of Swarna with higher grain number has been released as a new variety called DRR 40. And it's uh, being grown in many areas of the country. And now coming to uh, quickly uh, with uh, terms of conclusions of future prospects, one thing what we need to uh, understand is all these have been possible because we collaborated with open heart or the other institutes also collaborated with us with, us with open heart uh, for the last 25 years. Like uh, we have uh, collaborations with multiple institutes like CCMB, NAPGR, National Chemical Laboratory and all the institutes we have got good collaborations. So nothing is possible in a solitary manner. We need to collaborate, complement and then supplement. It's rather to avoid competition. This Collaboration, complementation, and supplementation will always work. And uh, important thing, what we need to notice is improved Samba Masuri. The area is steadily increasing, even after almost 12 or 13 years of deployment. This has been possible because we selected the right gene combination and also we deployed the right strategy, that is, mark crested backcross breeding involving four back backcrosses. And another important thing is we also shown that. In addition to having a single trait, it's always good to have multiple traits like bacterial blight resistance plus blast resistance plus low soil tolerance or other uh, additional traits. Uh, so in future, breeders will not only try to improve one trait, 
they will be doing multi trait packaging or multi trait uh, introgression and this is a way forward and this can be done in an accelerated way through genomics assisted selection i'll briefly explain what uh, later in my next slide so the cultivation of improved samba masuri has clearly shown benefits to farmers in bacterial blight prone areas so this has clearly shown that macrostate selection can deliver products at a quickly at a lower cost so what was the funding from government for development of improved samba masuri it was hardly 52 lakhs what value it has got it has got value of more than almost about 300 or 350 crores till date so macrostate selection quickly deliver products and then it can be beneficial also and what is important is the future of molecular breeding is genomics assisted breeding dr rajiv would have uh, uh, put into your mind the importance of genomics assisted breeding and there are three ways to deploy genomics assisted breeding in macrostate breeding and preferably this should be done through outsourcing mode one is through high density genotyping platforms this will be done or used only for gene discovery studies and linkage mapping instruments and medium density genotyping platforms will be done for genomic selection genetic diversity analysis and also for background selection the thing of relevance for breeders is a low density genotyping platform which can be very well utilized for routine breeding applications like forward breeding through mas macrostate backcrossing and also through macrostate recurrent selection and uh, if anybody is interested uh, they can refer to these three publications which are available in public domain and uh, they will help you to understand how we can transition from uh, conventional breeding to macrostate breeding and from macrostate breeding to genomics assisted breeding so i just like to mention that my journey with regard to macrostate breeding i started through a, as a bullock cart journey when i joined we were using a few uh, pcr based markers like rapds and also uh, hybridization markers like uh, rfrp then when i joined irr we jumped into maruti 800 car or say with slight uh, higher throughput or higher speed we were using ssr markers or microsatellite markers issr markers cat markers amplicon link polymorphism markers and all and then finally we started moving just like ecrisat for the past say 3 or 4 years wherein we are uh, through outsourcing mode we are using automated gel free marker state selection using snp markers so the need of the hour for most of the labs is investment in high throughput marker state selection uh, and uh, through this right kind of investment and then selecting the right kind of manpower uh, certainly improvements are possible in in our breeding programs and what we need to remember is when i have uh, 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 sung gaga or marker state breeding we need to remember that it's one among the many tools available to a breeder for example compare a breeder with a mechanic he can use a cutting plier he can use a spanner he can use any kind of tool for his work but for a particular breeder marker state selection is a very valuable tool which can complement and supplement the process of breeding so breeding will continue marker state breeding or genomic assisted breeding can only complement the breeder it cannot replace the breeder and uh, as i told you we are uh, slowly moving towards the generation of genomics assisted breeding hopefully probably when you'll be hearing me after uh, about 5 years i'll be talking more about genomics assisted breeding and less about uh, macrostate breeding as such and uh, i would like to thank my all my partners uh, at uh, ccmb my gurus dr ak singh dr nk singh dr ramesh sonti and all my lab mates uh, present lab mates and also past lab mates and also my colleagues for providing kind support for this particular efforts thank you very much i also thank pune knowledge cluster for providing this opportunity to interact with the trainees thank you very much thank you sir for a very very informative lecture uh, we this is the third lecture we have had on rice the first lecture was given by professor singh where he talked about the wild rice uh, accessions which he has collected then professor ravindran from pnau gave a talk on uh, some of the genes which you also included in your talk and about marker assisted breeding and you are the first person who is talking about biotic stress and uh, its improvement in rice so these three lectures have nicely complemented each other in the in this series of talks well there are some questions put up by the participants they range from very simple questions like is uh, resistance to bacterial blight Um, an oligogenic or polygenic trait 
then um, what is the difference between foreground and background selection so um, these type of questions i think can be found in textbooks now so uh, it's yeah. okay to uh, answer them over here but one interesting question i found was that uh, uh, he is asking whether the selection of uh, light resistance from ss1113 could have led to a positive linkage drag which contributed to the low glycemic index um uh, interestingly that's what is surprising for us uh, ss2113 is a high glycemic index variety its glycemic index is around 62 or 63 Okay. uh of course samba masuri is a sort of low to moderate it's about 58 to uh, 57 so where from it has come we don't know there is still about 2 to 3% genome of ss1113 but they are not pertaining to starch biosynthetic pathway genes but what we are expecting is there could be some local genomic rearrangements or recombinations which might have given this low glycemic index property so it's a question we are still trying to answer by whole genome sequencing of samba masuri improved samba masuri and then ss2113 probably in other say 3 or 6 months we are uh, will be cloning some of the pathway genes and then validating them maybe in a year i'll be able to answer uh, this particular question still it is a open uh, uh, the same question okay one more question is that how many traits can be introduced into one line you so, already talked about 3 4 <laughs> so remember we are not going to tightly pack up all the traits in the background of samba masuri at the best about 6 uh, to 8 genes or say about 3 uh, to 4 traits or in the maximum scenario probably once we try to assemble like a pyramid one side a breeding line of samba masuri with three traits other side a breeding line of samba masuri with three traits when you intercross them probably six traits can be combined or about 10 to 12 genes can be combined but there is a limitation to it the limitation is that it will also bring in undesirable uh, uh, genomic regions from the donor genomes so uh, it's a question we will also trying to answer through we now have uh, four uh, trait combined lines three trait combined lines we are very critically evaluating them from seed to maturity and uh, we'll uh, uh, together with our uh, good uh, phenotyping facility and also through genomic tools we try to answer the questions but uh, if i am a pragmatic breeder i will not go more than three traits or about six genes in my breeding program ideally speaking okay yeah a question related to this was have you found that the quality could be compromised when you put in so many uh, stress tolerant genes into rice yeah uh, fortunately or unfortunately uh, many of the green quality associated genes are located on chromosome 6 and chromosome 5 uh, fortunately none of these uh, trait specific genes like biotic stress resistant gene or abiotic stress resistant gene except uh, pa2 are located on chromosome 6 so probably when we are using pa2 we are indeed seeing that it is bringing some kind of linkage drag so we are trying to deploy some other gene present on some other chromosome uh, probably there will be better choice but as on date or as of now we are not measured glycemic index of improved versions of samba improved samba masuri like here are done 53 57 or 59 so far we don't have an answer to this particular question maybe now we have indicated that started initiated the clinical trials with national institute of nutrition hyderabad so in other 6 months or 8 months after three rounds of clinical trials we can be absolutely sure whether further improvements they do impact an important an economically important trait like glycemic index or not presently i don't have an answer madam so one of the participants is from the state agriculture university and uh, they want to know how to get wild variety of uh, rice from where can they get this germ plasma yeah there are uh, three or four sources uh, one can write directly to international rice research institute they have got uh, international rice germplasm database as part of their website and then you can put up a online request other ways to get it quickly re importing from iri will take a lot of time because one has to prepare an import permit submit it to nbpgr wait for permission then seeds will be imported nbpgr will do the quarantine testing so it can take anywhere between 3 months to 9 months one of the easier ways to get it from nbpgr 
who have got more than 22,000 accessions of wild rices at their disposal. And uh, if we can uh, indicate, say, one or two wild rice accessions from each of the wild rice species, probably they'll quickly transfer it to you under a material transfer agreement. The other source is wherein they've got a small but important set of wild rice connections. And uh, NRRA, that is National Rice Research Institute, based at Katak, our sister institute, who also have a large collection of wild rices specific for Eastern India, one can write to these institutes also. So I uh, request Vidya to add if she wants any comments or anything. Uh, and then, and then I think um, uh, Sundaram has given excellent lecture. Uh, I mean, you can make out that he is a very good teacher. Uh, he tried to explain it very well. So those who are naive to the field um, could understand it very well. And that's what we see the uh, chat box also, many comments uh, regarding your lecture, which you have reached to genomics assisted breeding. And such examples, I think, successful examples, which shows the real benefit to the farmers, I think those are very influential on the uh, students who are in this field. Um, that is what I feel. And I think uh, uh, scientists like you uh, surely have that impression on uh, students. No doubt people like us are also impressed uh, by your detail, presentation, knowledge, and uh, thought process about selecting the genes. But students will surely get highly impressed. Uh, thir mm -hmm. I'm thoroughly impressed. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. That Thank is you. what most of the participants have um, noticed, yes. that you, know, you are uh, delivering products, which is very much uh, yes. missing in agricultural universities otherwise. So yeah. they are all very uh, appreciative um, of the point. <laughs> uh, I would not uh, agree with the comment, madam. Uh, most of the agriculture universities are unsung heroes. They do a lot of work, uh, but they don't know how to taunt on their causes. So whatever that has been possible is because, see, for example, the donor parent has been possible because they worked very hard for almost nine or 10 years, starting from 1991 to 2001, to yeah. develop SS3. Pro possibly, probably they didn't uh, popularize it or... Uh, uh, take it to logical conclusion. So my uh, submission here is uh, uh, it's important to do a good work, but also to tom tom your own cause. <laughs> so lectures, or in terms of uh, taking it forward to people. There are I think, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I think you, you made a point very, very clear that with such a comparatively small research grant, you know, when you initiated this work, probably you may not have seen the real uh, uh, monetary benefits out of this. You initiated it as a research project with, say, 52 lakhs. But, uh, you know, your perseverance uh, helped you in taking it to a product in case of a very popular variety where now in 10 years, we see the monetary gains almost 500 times, I mean, 240 crores, and it will surely go on. So this is something very, very uh, unique, and only perseverance in the field would give such benefits. Thank you, madam. And that is one thing I would also like to uh, tell many of the youngsters. It is indeed, this field is very lucrative, and there are also opportunities for guerrilla warfare kind of research. <laughs> Uh, they may give you a uh, lot of publications. They may give you name and fame. But at the end of uh, the day, uh, when you evaluate a person in terms of his career, it will be based on how sincerely or how uh, dedicatedly he has worked and then taken a forward a problem and then taken uh, bringing the solution to its logical conclusion. So you can always venture into new areas. But my humble submission is, Take one or two research topics, particularly to the youngsters, to your heart, and then take them to logical conclusion. Name and fame will follow you. No need for you to run after it, and it will follow you. But be focused in your research, and then uh, try to work on a specific topic uh, in a very deep manner. At least for 15, 20 years, fruits will come. Uh, fruits or rewards will follow themselves. That will be my submission, madam. Yeah.
I uh, Sujata, I just wanted to mention one thing. If you have seen his uh, awards, in one of them he has a CSIR award for uh, rural development, science and technology for the rural development, and uh, I mean uh, that award is really for this kind of discoveries. which would really lead to the uh, monetary upliftment of rural people so that indicates that his work is uh, how worth it is thank you sundaram thank you madam and thank uh, you, uh, yeah thank you thank you madam yeah okay so i think we will end the session here yeah and yeah. Uh, Yes, and we will interact with you if there are any more questions. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, like I'll share uh, shortly a copy of my presentation as a PDF file, and the okay. participants are free to ask questions through email or any other means also. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. Shake hands with you, so a namaste will be a. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, ma'am. Um, can I end the meeting now? Yeah, yeah. You have to just announce for tomorrow's session. Ah, uh, yes. So for tomorrow, uh, as usual, we will start at ten o'clock, and the same link would work for all the others, all the sessions till Friday. See you tomorrow at ten o'clock. Sure. Thank you. Okay. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.